All right, and now we have to, to do a little mathematical work. Uh, if we have an equation like this, does this equation mean that there's a direct relationship between a and x or an inverse? Let's kind of work that through. Let's say that x was to increase and we're holding y constant. If we increase x while we hold y constant, uh, what do we have to do to a to make the equation still true? Increase a or decrease a? Okay, so is there a direct or inverse relationship between a and x? of the time when I ask the students this question, they give the wrong answer. Usually when I ask what happens when you increase x, people say, oh, a will increase. Uh, but it's important to see why that's not right. I think they're kind of thinking, g, I'm multiplying a by a bigger number. Um, well, that would make, maybe that would make a times x bigger, but it doesn't make a bigger. Remember, the whole point here is if you want to know the relationship between two variables, you should ask, what happens if I change these two variables and hold everything else constant? If we want to know the relationship here, we should be holding this constant. Uh, well, if this is constant on the right, then we can't have any change on the left-hand side either. So if you start increasing one part of the left-hand side, we have to decrease the other part. Okay. So actually, uh, for most students, this isn't that obvious, but this is actually a very important principle in physics. You see many different equations, and whenever you see the equation, it's very important to be able to tell from that whether it means a direct or an inverse relationship. Well, this means an inverse relationship between a and x. Um, how about between a and y? Do A and Y here have a direct or an inverse relationship? If I hold X constant. We should definitely do that. Mm -hmm. And I increase A. That's a good analysis. Um, that means that Y will increase. Yeah. So it's a direct relationship. Okay, well that, that's really the exact right way to work it out step by step like that. Okay. So one good thing that you did is you said, gee, if I want to know the relationship between A and Y, I should hold everything else constant. So we held this constant. Well then, you changed one of the variables. Well, if we, start, if we start increasing the left-hand side, the only way the equation can still be true is if we also increase the right-hand side, since we're holding this constant. So that's really the exact right way to work this out. And again, very often when I ask people this question, they actually get the wrong answer. That's probably because they're not actually drawing these arrows. It helps to actually draw the arrows so you can think through step-by-step step who you're changing and who you're holding constant. Okay, so um, we can see here variables on the same side have a direct relationship. Variables on the opposite side have inverse. There's more complicated situations. For example, I could have asked you, say, what's the relationship between A and Z here, and A and W, uh, that's important, but uh, maybe one thing at a time, so we'll get back to that if we need that. But for today, these were the key things we needed, but uh, eventually we need to know all these types of relationships, and you figure them out all the same way by holding everything else constant. All right, but I think this will be good enough for us now, so uh, let's move on with this. So, if we were going to write an equation that relates P and V, um, should P and V be on the same side of the equation? or different sides of the equation. Now let's see here. We want the same side. Is there inverse? Yeah. We want to put them on the same side so that if we hold the right hand side constant, anytime you increase P, you have to decrease B. Okay. Alright, now our next concept is uh, lowercase n. That's a concept you might have seen in chemistry. I don't know, do you remember what lowercase n stands for in chemistry? I don't remember. So this is the number of moles. This is the number of moles that we're working with. Lowercase n is going to stand for our number of moles. So the unit is moles. That's right. So remember, what is a mole? It's just a really big number. Uh, when, when people learn about this, usually the instructor makes an analogy with the word dozen. The word dozen is just a word for a number. Well, the word mole is also just a word for a number. 
Just like the word dozen means 12, the word mole just means a very big number. In fact, what does the word mole mean? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, approximately. It means about 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So roughly speaking, a mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, just like a dozen is 12. All right, and this is a, a good way for counting how, mu how many molecules you have. This is a good way to count how many molecules. Why can't we just say how many molecules we have? Because that would be too big of a number. Uh, it helps to use a very huge number to count these because otherwise uh, we'd be talking about too big of a number. Usually, since, mo uh, since molecules are so small, you end up with lots and lots of molecules. Now, let's go back to our uh, cardboard box analogy. So what does lowercase n stand for in the cardboard box analogy? If you were somehow to increase lowercase n, what would you be doing in our analogy? Yeah, you'd be adding more particles. Yeah. That would increase the pressure. That's right. And what, well, that's right. Why is that? Um, with a, a higher number of molecules colliding on the side of the box, that will equal more collisions. Inside. Yeah. The pressure comes from the collisions. Well, if there's more molecules, there'll be more collisions. More molecules means more collisions. So it's pretty straightforward. The more ping pong balls you put inside, the greater the pressure. There you go. You read my mind. That's right. That's a direct relationship. So where does the n go in this formula? On the same side as the p or the opposite side as the p to show that they're directly related? Now, if we hold v constant, if you increase n, you'd have to increase p, showing there's a direct relationship. OK, good. Another important concept is temperature. Uh, what would be a good symbol for temperature? A. Now, that would be a good symbol for the units, which are kelvins. That's getting, uh, just jumping ahead in one sec, but that's right. The units are in kelvins. We also need a symbol for the concept of temperature, which would be capital T for temperature. Capital T for temperature. We're using lowercase t for time, so we can use capital T for temperature. And you're right that the official SI units for temperature are kelvins. Okay, now uh, actually we know that in ordinary life we don't usually use kelvins. We usually use Celsius, right? Um, so this is a very common unit conversion that we have to be comfortable with, translating back and forth between uh, kelvins and Celsius. So here's the equation that relates kelvins and Celsius. The temperature in kelvins is the temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. For, um, for Fahrenheit, is it, we subtract 273? Fahrenheit is a whole different thing. Uh, it's much more complicated. It's something like 9 fifths times the temperature plus something. Uh, I didn't see any problems where you had to do that in the homework, uh, however. So you can cross that bridge if you need to. Uh, they probably have the formula that relates Fahrenheit and Celsius in the book, but I don't know if you're actually going to need that in this course. On the other hand, it's very common. You definitely will need this, uh, this one. OK. So yeah, the Fahrenheit conversion uh, between Fahrenheit and Celsius is a little more complicated, but we'll just focus on this one. Uh, and in fact, I don't know, why don't we just call this 273? That's usually going to be close enough for us. OK. So we'll approximate and just add 273. By the way, the convention is you say degrees Celsius, but you don't say degrees Kelvin. You just say Kelvin. So there's no little circle here for Kelvin. All right. Now, um, do you remember what, what is the freezing point in Celsius? That would be Fahrenheit, actually. That would be Fahrenheit. Yeah, Celsius was designed to have a very intuitive freezing point of zero degrees. And uh, do you remember the boiling point in Celsius? 100. That's right. 
So you can see why uh, old Celsius, who came up with this, thought this was a good idea. These seems like nice even numbers for the freezing point and the boiling point. Now, of course, this is not what we use in ordinary life. In ordinary life, we use Fahrenheit in the US. Um, so we don't really have much feel for these numbers over here. Um, in Fahrenheit, I think boiling is like 212. Um, and freezing is like 32 degrees, so, okay. Uh, but uh, in chemistry and physics, we use either Celsius or Kelvin, even though the standard answer Kelvin. So here's our freezing point and the boiling point. So for practice, what would be the freezing point in Kelvins? 273. Right. And what would be the boiling point? 373. Because you just added 273 to these two numbers. So the only way you can make a mistake is by add, uh, subtracting 273 when you should be adding. So you just have to make sure you're using the formula correctly. Okay, so um, these are the freezing point and boiling point in Kelvins. 